please join me in uh, welcoming Ian and, and, uh, and his presentation on the Deposit River watershed. And thank you, Ian. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me, Philip. And, and hello to everyone. It's a little funny in this format, not being able to see anybody, but, but I know you're out there and I look forward to hearing some of your questions. So I have some slides that I am just going to get uh, get started here. Bear with me a moment. All right. So as Phil said, my name is Ian Cook, and I am the executive director of the Neponset River Watershed Association. Um, if you're wondering what the Neponset River Watershed is, this is a map of the Neponset River Watershed. It is a uh, area of land. It's the area of land that drains into the Neponset River. So if you took this map outside in the rain, basically everything that fall, all the rain that falls in the yellow one eventually makes its way into the Neponset River and uh, down to Dorchester Bay. And uh, the river, I don't know if you can see my pointer there, but the river starts right here in Foxborough and your next door neighbor. It kind of makes its way through Walpole kind of up the middle of the map down to, um, to Dorchester Bay and Boston Harbor. So we have the stadium at one end and the, the painted Boston gas tank at the other end. And the watershed includes parts of 14 cities and towns. About 330,000 or so people live in the deposit watershed. Uh, about 120,000 people get some or all of their drinking water from groundwater sources uh, in the watershed. So a, a lot of people, a lot of uh, history, um, and and a lot of uh, valuable natural resources, all in all in one area. Just to give you a little background, this is probably a little confusing, but but we used to have pictures of our staff that were like actual people standing next to each other outdoors, but of course you can't do that anymore. So now we have you know fake Zoom images, but this is our staff. The Watershed Association is a private nonprofit conservation group. We're uh, supported by members and volunteers and various other kinds of donors. And we have uh, nine staff that works out to about, uh, about eight full-time equivalents. Um, and really our job is to try to bring people together, all different kinds of people, to work together to clean up and protect the Neponset River. And we have been around working on this for a long time. We were actually founded back in 1967 at our 50th anniversary a few years ago. And really we try to bring together um, people from all kinds of walks of life. So citizen volunteers, local officials are really key, key players in all of this, local business people, homeowners, uh, people in the construction trade, scientists, all getting those folks to work together towards the common goal of trying to give us a clean, uh, healthy river that everyone can, can get out and enjoy. And there's a few things we do uh, towards that goal. So a big one is education, just getting people to, uh, to be aware of the river, of how it works, of uh, where their water comes from, where it goes to when they're done. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, working with kids. This is our, um, our uh, outreach director, Nancy Filer, uh, talking to a, a classroom of fifth graders. We also spend a lot of time doing science work, monitoring the health of the river, you know, and, and I think a lot of people probably assume like, oh yeah, the government's out there testing the water all the time, making sure it's good. And in fact, it's been a, a very long time since the state or federal government has taken any water quality tests in the deposit. Um, but we have a network of, of about 60 volunteers who monitor 40 locations across the watershed six times a year. And it provides sort of the foundation of, um, of data to be able to see where we have problems and to, um, to hopefully track progress in, in resolving those problems. Another big thing we do is uh, advocacy, uh, working with cities and towns, uh, local volunteers, local organizations on um, trying to get policies and investments made to help clean up and protect the river. Um, some of that happens uh, at the state level, at the state house. Uh, a tiny bit of it happens at the federal level, but by and large, you know, the most, um, the level of government that has the biggest influence on the health of your river is really your city or town. Um, they're really the ones who are sort of on the ground um, making the, the decisions that are going to shape the health of your river. And of course, the last thing we do is we get involved in lots of hands-on cleanup work. 
these are some volunteers actually down in Hyde Park getting a truck tire out of the river. It's sort of endlessly fascinating how many tires there, there are in the river. There's lots of them and you think they're all gone and then next year there's more. Um, so cleaning up the river, uh, beautifying it, do undertaking habitat restoration projects. This is actually the, uh, the Cedar Swamp in Walpole, which is a pretty amazing resource. Um, so that's kind of us. And I wanna take just a second and orient you towards Walpole's water resources. So there's a lot going on in this map, but uh, kind of over towards the, the left side of your screen, the bold red line is the town boundary of Walpole. Um, and Walpole has a lot of water. You basically have the Neponset River kind of running right through the middle of town and, and out the other side. You've got School Meadow Brook coming down uh, from the Foxborough Sharon line. You've got uh, Mill Mine Brook coming down out of uh, Medfield, Spring Brook, um, Bird Pond, Willet Pond, several tributaries to Willet Pond. Walpole really has, has a wealth of water and, and almost all of the town is, is in the Neponset watershed. You can see there's a little area um, over here, just a little corner of town it does drain to the to the Charles River watershed, but almost all the town drains into the Neponsa watershed. Um, the other thing you can see on this map is you can see the green areas, which are protected conservation land, and very important in Walpole, the purple areas, which are uh, drinking water uh, protection areas for for groundwater uh, recharge and groundwater protection. Uh, and one of the things that's really fascinating about the river, I think, is its history. You know, the river, the Neponset is, um, you know, the, it's a river with history. It's not a pristine river. You know, we have no illusions about that. This is actually a, uh, a map of Walpole in 1882. Uh, it's really kind of fascinating to, I don't know if you can see it well enough at this, at this resolution. But it's fascinating to really look at this map. You can you can find it at the um, Leventhal Map Center at uh, the Boston Public Library online. Um, but it sort of shows what Walpole looked like, you know, 100, almost 150 years ago, and it's it's pretty impressive. You know, really the reason Walpole was founded was because of its water resources. And I think probably everybody's heard the the story of the sawmill near uh, what's now the White's Bridge in uh, the town forest. And, and that was sort of the first economic activity that really uh, attracted settlers to the area. And it was a combination of, of natural resources that drew people to the area. One was the cedar swamp, which was the source for trees. And then two was the river, which was a source of uh, falling water that could be dammed and used to drive machinery back in the days before uh, fossil fuels. And now this is, uh, that was in the, in the 1600s that that sawmill got started. Um, and on the heels of that, you saw tremendous uh, industrial growth and, and all kinds of economic activity spring up in Walpole that you can sort of see in this map. And just to give you a sample, here's one, one little uh, uh, detail from that map. I, I love this one because it's got the guy down uh, out in his boat on the pond. And I sort of wondered what he's doing out there. Is he just out there rowing? But this is uh, Maury's Pond, which is now known as Turner's Pond. And to think about in 1882, the, the level of activity that's captured in this picture, you know, the level of people that, uh, that were involved in this. So it was, it was uh, a, big, a big endeavor uh, back in those days. This is, um, it's kind of a faded postcard, but a historic postcard showing Stetson's Falls, which is right behind, um, Watson's Candy still was another center of, uh, of various mills and, and in industrial activity right, right downstream of the middle of town. And then of course, further down in East Walpole, you had uh, Bird and Son that um, grew up and became a very large uh, enterprise back in the day. This is sort of looking downstream towards the downstream end of uh, Bird Pond. And you can sort of see some of the mill buildings over on the left that are actually below the water level, uh, which are still there today. Um, and then a little further downstream from that, Hollingsworth and Vose Company, another major industrial uh, concern. And in fact, one of the very 
few uh, companies that started as a, a very early water powered industry in the Neponset watershed that is still in our area engaged in industrial manufacturing today. You know, over the last 20 years, we've seen uh, many of those companies, the Kendall Company, the, the Bird Machine Company, the Plymouth Rubber Company down at Canton, have, uh, which were still around 20 years ago, have, have largely uh, moved on now. But h and still, still keeps plugging away in, um, in East Walpole and still uses water uh, from the river for their industrial process. So if we flash forward from, from the, uh, the last century to this one, uh, one of the big questions people always ask me is, um, you know, so, so why, why should I care about the river? What, what, uh, what is it doing for me? Uh, what should I know about it? And if you live in Walpole, sort of one of the most important functions of the river and the watershed is providing you with your drinking water. You know, 100% of Walpole's drinking water comes from groundwater sources in the Neponset watershed. These are not, it's not actually coming from the river. It's coming from wells, uh, which are generally near the river or its tributaries. And uh, the town is entirely dependent on that. There are um, some nearby water systems that get water from other sources. Uh, Mass Water Resources Authority water is not too far away, but, but Walpole is still entirely dependent on the Neponset. And, you know, the the wells are not uh, drawing water out of the river, but um, you know, ultimately uh, all of our water is to some degree connected. And if you have a polluted river, one can't feel very confident that you're gonna have clean groundwater right next to that river. So keeping the river clean uh, is uh, a very, um, very advantageous in terms of keeping our drinking water clean in Walpole. The other thing about the Neponset River in Walpole, aside from its, its history, is it just helps to define the quality of life and the character of the town. This is looking upstream from, um, from Plumpton Street in East Walpole. This is in another season with a little more uh, artistic photograph. This is uh, in the town forest, um, the Neponset River passing through the town forest, a beautiful spot, an amazing uh, protected resource in the center of town. Yeah somebody out enjoying a little uh, canoe fishing in the town forest. The, the river is really a, a tremendous recreational resource. It's in many areas, it's kind of hard to find. You have to go looking for it. You know, so I think it's, it's an underutilized resource in many regards. Um, and of course, one of the, um, the great historic uh, recreational uses on the Neponset, on, in the Neponset watershed was on Willet Pond. This is actually in Norwood, where uh, Norwood used to have a, a public town beach near where St. Timothy's is on Willet Pond. Uh, that was closed uh, many years ago, I believe in the 1950s, but it was a major recreational destination uh, back in the day. And in fact, we're gonna talk a little bit about Willet Pond, which is um, has spent the last 60 or so years not accessible to the public. And uh, as of uh, 2019, now, now is accessible to the public, which is great. Another important value of the river uh, is as a fish and wildlife habitat. One of the things that is really neat about Walpole is that Walpole, if you can believe it, uh, is home to the best trout stream in Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, years ago, there was actually a, uh, a Trap Hole Brook um, fishing club, which was focused on uh, catching the trout in Trap Hole Brook. And the fishing club is, is long gone, but amazingly, the trout are still here. This is actually a, what's called a brook trout. It's a native, beautiful native uh, fish. They're very sensitive to, uh, to pollution. They need very cool, clean water and a nice uh, gravelly stream bed with lots of shade. And this map sort of shows, points out just how significant the, um, the, the brook trout population in Walpole is. This is a map put together by the Department of Fish and Game, the State Department of Fish and Game. And the red dots are basically known uh, brook trout populations throughout the state. The size of the dot uh, corresponds to uh, the size of the population. And if you look over on the left side of the map, you know, look, look at all that red. There's lots of trout out there. If you look on the right side of the map, there's practically nothing except 
this uh, this huge dot here, which is Trap Holbrook and Walpole. Um, really an amazing resource that's managed to uh, to survive all these years. Ian? Yeah, it just as you go on, we have one, one we do have one question um, that you could you might answer where appropriate. Sure. Um, and that is talking about where one could put a kayak in the Nepansa, in Walpole. Ah, okay. Um, why, why don't I get that at the end? Because I'm, I'm actually going to sort of circle back around to, uh, to recreational access. So we can talk more about that. Thank you. You know, lots of uh, wetlands, ponds, streams. These are just some painted turtles uh, enjoying a sunny day. Another thing that folks wouldn't realize is, did you know that there are shellfish in Walpole? Walpole has um, actually a fairly significant population of, uh, of freshwater mussels, of a species that is actually quite, quite rare in this part of the state. Again, at the Long Trapple Brook, which is such a uh, unique and special waterway. And of course, a lot of people have probably seen the bald eagles that have been uh, hanging around uh, Walpole the last couple of years. This one is happens to be flying over Turner's Pond. Should have had a zoom lens when we took this picture. But. Um, so lots of uh, valuable resources, drinking water, recreational features, aesthetic features, wildlife features still along the Neponset River and its tributaries in Walpole. But of course, not, not everything is perfect. We still do have some, some challenges and some opportunities to make things better. I'm going to take just a, a few minutes and talk about those. One of the things I mentioned is that we do, um, we and our volunteers conduct uh, water quality monitoring um, at 41 locations around the watershed. This is kind of what water quality monitoring looks like. Get the waders on and wait out there and get your gloves and, uh, and get a sample. This is a former staff person of ours. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's there's still work to do along the Neponset in terms of water quality, but most people I think would probably be shocked to see this graph. So these are the, the six locations in Walpole where we collect water quality samples. And this is showing uh, the samples over the last three years and the results for, uh, for E. coli, which is an indicator of uh, sewage and bacterial pollution. In the river, and and what's amazing about this is, you know, back in the industrial era, you know, the the Neponset was really quite severely polluted, both by industrial discharges and the industrial activity brought with it uh, a domestic population, which really didn't have a functioning wastewater disposal system. So both the industrial effluent and the domestic effluent all kind of found its way into the river, and the river was. It was pretty unpleasant, you know, really through the, the 50s, 60s, and, and even into the 70s. Um, and that's always been a very big focus of what our organization does. But today, you look at the Neponset River in Walpole, and of the, of the six sites that we monitor, three of them, when it's not raining out, every single time we sampled them, have been clean enough to swim in. So Turner's Pond, the Neponset River in the Hollingsworth and Bowes Pond, which is just downstream of Bird Pond, and School Meadow Brook, which is up near uh, Ganawati Farm Pond. 100% um, of the time, swimmable water quality during dry weather. Um, we do have a couple areas that have, have some, uh, some, some other, and actually, I'm sorry, I forgot Willow Pond. It was behind the little Zoom window thing. Yes, Willow Pond, also 100% swimmable. Um, but you see, we do, and we do still have some challenges on um, the, the Neponset River at, in the town forest near South Street and also on Spring Brook, which is sort of near the town hall that we take that sample. But the big story with this graph is we're, we're doing pretty well when it's sunny out, but when it's raining, uh, the river is a lot less clean, um, as you can see in the red bars. And I just want to take a little second and talk about that and the context of um, what are really the remaining water quality challenges on the river. We've, we've largely taken care of those big industrial discharges and those sort of wholesale sewer discharges, but uh, we still have some challenges. And this is uh, the root uh, of our challenge. Um, as you probably know, this is a storm drain. Technically, it's a catch basin inlet. And uh, 
this leads directly from uh, streets all over the town. There's probably, I'm going from memory here, so don't, don't hold me to this, but I would guess there's probably 6,000 catch basins in the town of Walpole, if I'm remembering right. It could be off by a thousand or two, but it's it's in that ballpark. And almost every single one of these leads uh, directly to the river, to some place like this, so-called storm drain outfall. Um, our drainage systems that take uh, the water off our streets and neighborhoods were, were really designed to just get rid of that water as quickly as possible. Um, and almost everywhere, those storm drains uh, lead right to the river. So when it's raining, this is what you get at the other end, sort of the street water coming right out uh, into the river with, with no treatment. This storm drain outfall is sort of typical looking. It's actually not in Walpole. This one's actually in Hyde Park, but it's a, an artistic picture of a... Um, and the result is the kind of poor water quality we saw on the graph, or this, which is a, an algae bloom caused by phosphorus pollution. And this is actually in Turner Pond a couple of years ago. So even though if you remember, Turner Pond was swimmable 100% of the time, but that doesn't mean you would necessarily want to swim in it when it looked like this. Another big challenge with these storm drain outfalls is that we, we no longer have sewers that um, sort of just wholesale are designed to discharge from the Ponset River. But we do have uh, in our area, and this is not unique to Walpole, a lot of older infrastructure uh, that still has some challenges. So we have a storm drain systems that are supposed to take the water from the street and bring it to the stream. And we have sewer systems that are supposed to take the water from your bathroom and bring them to the wastewater treatment plant, which in Walpole's case means uh, your island out in Boston Harbor or to your septic system. But because we have old infrastructure, we sometimes end up with cross connections uh, between these two systems. And this is actually a storm drain outfall on, uh, in uh, Westwood that we discovered a few years ago. And it's, if you notice, it's, it's flowing. It's, may not be able to tell from the picture, but it's not raining. So nothing should be coming out of here. And it's looking very green. And if you look very carefully, you can see some sort of flecks of white amidst the, amidst the green. And in fact, this was a situation where a, a house was connected to the storm drain instead of to the sewer. And the storm drain just took, took those people's bathroom and sent it right to the local stream. Um, it's not that unusual of a situation. Um, and one of the things our cities and towns are working on right now or trying to help them do is going through a process of checking all of their drains to try to make sure that we've eliminated these kinds of um, cross connections and, and other problems. Another issue with um, storm drains is flooding. Um, this is actually, this is not in Walpole, this is actually uh, a few years ago over in, um, in Canton during a sort of moderate uh, flood event, a 40 year flood event uh, that produced some pretty significant damage in, in part because it was a combination of a flood event and a dam failing during a flood event. Uh, so the water from the dam was added to the high uh, natural flow that really produced this, this situation. But one of the, the challenges, one of the other challenges that comes with uh, stormwater and our drainage systems is that not only were our drain systems designed to get the water from our streets to the river without any treatment, they were generally designed to get the water from the streets to the river as fast as humanly possible. Um, and that has really sped up the hydrology of the river and contributes to much higher um, peak flows, when it's raining hard, the flow in the river is much higher than it would naturally be if it was sort of filtering through, through natural floodplains. So uh, the flooding piece is also connected to, uh, to our storm drain issues. So what do you do about that? Uh, this is a lovely poster put together by a, uh, a high school student at, um, in the town of uh, Sharon, build a rain garden. The solution to stormwater is surprisingly simple. It's really to simply break that direct connection from the street to the stream and divert uh, water to some place where it can soak into the ground, get absorbed by plants. The plants will help to take pollution out of it, get filtered through the soil, 
recharge into the groundwater to keep our drinking water clean and, and filled up and, and to slow down, to reduce that, that flooding issue. And projects like that can happen at a small scale. This, 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 what we're looking at here is called a rain garden. It was built by the folks at St. John's Episcopal Church in, um, in Westwood, just a group of volunteers in an afternoon built this. And what's happening is you can't see it, but off to the right, there's a, a large parking lot for the church. And they basically dug this little channel coming in from the right that will capture the runoff as it uh, comes off the parking lot. And instead of going to the catch basin, it'll come down this little channel and into this little garden area and fill it up with water and the water will soak into the ground. It's essentially a man-made puddle. Um, and uh, it's sort of uh, brilliant in its simplicity, but incredibly powerful in terms of reducing flood impacts and improving water quality. And of course, you can do that on a larger scale. This is, this is a project in, um, in Stoughton that we worked on, where you have a school is sort of behind us in this picture is a very large uh, school parking lot that used to be piped directly to the river. And instead, it's now piped into this, uh, this little uh, detention basin area where the water will filter through the soil, through the plants, soak into the ground uh, before it gets discharged to the river. And yeah, we, we have another question that is related to uh, flooding. Sure. And that is, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with where Route 27 crosses under the, uh, the railroad bridge, downtown Walpole, going towards Medfield. Yep. There's, and that often floods. That it looks like they actually, I think the town put a couple uh, culverts there, a couple of uh, drains. But um, is there any way to solve that problem? Is that... Um, there's always a way to solve the, solve these problems. You know, one of the things that is really challenging is that, and, and Walpole is a great example of this, like downtown Walpole wasn't built two weeks ago. I mean, it was, it's been built organically since the 1600s. And, uh, you know, back in the day, people didn't always do things in the most thoughtful way. So one of the real challenges now uh, is that we're seeing more and more places, uh, particularly as climate change progresses and as rainfall events are getting bigger, where we're seeing flooding problems that aren't really flooding from the river, but they're inadequacies of our drainage system that are causing flooding. And certainly that little spot in Walpole is an example. You know, really the, the catastrophic example that we've seen in the last few years is the flooding actually that occurred in the in the early summer of 2020 in downtown Norwood, when there was just just a catastrophic amount of rain fell, completely overwhelmed the the drainage system in downtown Norwood, and the water had no place to go. Unfortunately, except for the the back door and ultimately the basement of the hospital, which is the last place you want it to go. Um, and I think those there are those kinds of problems sort of street flooding problems are going to become increasingly uh, problematic over time. And it is, you know, it's very site specific how you fix a problem like that. Um, you know, there are situations where, um, and I'm not sure if that's the case in this, in this particular underpass, but that, that underpass is very near the river. So in a, in a flood, the, the elevation of the river might even be the same or higher than the elevation of the underpass, which gets to be very challenging to fix. But it's, it's always possible to fix these things, but um, it requires a significant investment. And one of the other important characteristics of our drain infrastructure is that our drain infrastructure is um, kind of the poor stepchild of our sewer infrastructure and our water infrastructure. Um, you know, our, our water infrastructure, we pay a water bill and the water department uses that to, uh, to maintain the water system and make sure we have good water our sewer infrastructure, we pay a sewer bill and the sewer department uses that in conjunction with the Mass Water Resources Authority to make sure that their pipes and that things don't overflow. Our drainage infrastructure, if you've ever noticed, it doesn't have a bill. It's just as important as the sewer infrastructure and the water infrastructure, but it is entirely dependent on uh, the town and the town meeting deciding to appropriate money to fix a problem. There's no sort of consistent source of funding to consistently maintain things over time. And the drain infrastructure is constantly competing with every other priority that the town has 
in order to be properly maintained. And in many towns, that means the drain infrastructure has been very poorly maintained or designed over time. So definitely these are fixable problems, but they require uh, significant investment to address them. Um, and then the other uh, flip side of the flooding problem is a drought problem. So stormwater, the stormwater issue also contributes to drought issues. Um, so as I mentioned, when you, when you pave an area and build a parking lot or a big building, water is no longer soaking into the ground. And it's that water that soaks into the ground and becomes groundwater and part of our aquifer system that helps to keep both our water supplies replenished during a drought and helps keep the river flowing through uh, discharges from springs and, and seeps and other sources. So definitely, this is, uh, this is actually on Mill Mine Brook in Medfield uh, several years ago during a drought. These, are, these fish are not very happy at the moment. Um, and part of the challenge, uh, certainly drought is a natural phenomenon. We've always had droughts. But one of the big challenges in the Neponset watershed, as I mentioned, is a lot of people uh, withdraw drinking water from the watershed. And the way our, our systems are generally built is we withdraw drinking water from groundwater sources that are ultimately the, the same sources that feed the river in the summer. And then we throw away our used drinking water, i.e. sewage, and ship it uh, miles and miles away to Deer Island. So we're sort of taking, but never, never recycling. And the water withdrawals that are permitted in the Neponset watershed are pretty large compared to the Neponset River. You know, I believe it's 14 and a half million gallons a day of permitted water withdrawals across the Neponset watershed. And in the summer now, you know, the entire flow of the Neponset River can be depending on where, where you are, as low as 3 million gallons a day. So one of the things that we have really worked on, aside from trying to get communities to invest in their drainage systems to upgrade them, um, is also to invest in water efficiency. You know, one of the things about our water supplies and the way we use water in our homes is it's, it's pretty inefficient. We use a lot of water. It probably didn't need to be withdrawn, things like this little 10-gallon flush toilet, which there's not too many of these around anymore, but, um, but there's ones that are not quite that bad. And then the other big challenge is, you know, in the dry summer months, uh, this is, here's an example of somebody watering their lawn at, at noon. Most of the water is just sort of evaporating and not doing anybody any good. But in the summer, the reality is that um, the river is competing with our water supplies for the water needed to keep it flowing. So to the extent that we are it's spending a lot of water, you know, watering lawns. That's water that could have been flowing down the Neponset River, but 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 isn't. Um, so a big challenge and something we really uh, work with communities to try to encourage more efficient water use. And then the other thing that lays over both this question of drought and the question of flooding and the question of our stormwater infrastructure is climate change. I think folks uh, know that the climate is changing. It, it has changed substantially uh, already, let alone uh, what, what are the projections for the future. Certainly, we've all seen pictures of uh, you know, flooding in Boston as the sea level tends to be a little higher. Hopefully, that'll never be a problem in Walpole. But Walpole definitely still is going to have challenges with, with heat, with changing vegetation. And one of the biggest impacts has been changes in our patterns of precipitation. Um, so this is over the last, I believe it's from the, the last century, um, put together by NOAA, of the change in the percentage of our rainfall that arrives in heavy downpours, as opposed to sort of gentle mists. You know, historically, we used to get frequent and light rain, which was great because it kept the grass green, it helped to soak into the ground, and more and more, we're getting very heavy rainfalls, which sort of rush off in a big flood, especially when it's overlaid with um, lots of pavement and, and man-made drainage systems. And the change has actually been the most dramatic uh, in the Northeast of any place in the country. It's actually a 71% increase in these heavy downpours over the last century and a forecast for, for significant um, continued movement in that direction, which is really going to challenge our existing drainage infrastructure. And the flip side, the, the irony of climate change is it's both giving us 
more heavy downpours, but it's also going to give us more frequent and severe droughts. You know, climate change is all about the extremes. So we're, we're actually getting a little bit more water in total, but much more of it's falling in these heavy downpours and that it's going to be interspersed with more drought. So definitely, um, you know, we have these existing challenges around our drinking water infrastructure and our drainage infrastructure. And um, climate change is just layering on another level of difficulty and, and frankly, raising the imperative that, that we make some thoughtful investments in these systems so they'll continue to function well in the future. So this is um, uh, changing the topic entirely. Uh, this is uh, the Tileston and Hollingsworth Dam, which sounds a lot sort of like Hollingsworth and Vose. This, this Hollingsworth guy, he really got around because this is actually down in Hyde Park. Um, so it's, it's a ways away from Walpole, but um, this dam and one other dam, the so-called Baker Dam owned by the state are all that stands between Walpole and migratory fish. So this is a uh, American shad. This is not on the Neponset River. This is down um, in the Delaware River. Uh, but these fish live in the ocean and come upstream to spawn. And one project we've been working on for a long time is uh, getting these fish past those two dams. Um, and if you could do that, these fish would be able to get all the way back up to Walpole. Really an amazing um, restoration, which would bring incredible um, vibrancy back into the ecosystem of the Neponset River. Um, it's a long-term project. We've been working on it for 20 years and we'll probably be working on it for 20 more. But, uh, you know, get your fishing rod ready because these American chatter are pretty good. On a smaller scale, we have also been doing uh, habitat restoration work uh, aimed at uh, Walpole's local trout population. You know, so we mentioned that Walpole has this sort of exceptional trout population. And one of the things that poses a real challenge for these trout is, uh, is uh, barriers, basically obstacles in the stream that prevent the fish from being able to migrate up and down the stream in different seasons. And this, this becomes, again, becomes especially critical for these fish in a climate change scenario. As the temperature of the water starts to get warmer, that's gonna be a challenge for these fish and it's gonna become even more important for them to be able, you know, when the stream starts to dry, dry up, they need to be able to move downstream to find a nice cool deep pool. These are some volunteers on Trap Oak a couple of years ago uh, back behind the Siemens property, removing a small uh, rubble dam. So this was a pretty small barrier that we were able to simply disassemble with um, some enthusiastic volunteers. And this is after about four hours of work by those volunteers. Now the fish can get right through. And it was amazing uh, the day we did this. You could see within a half hour of after we stopped moving rocks, you could actually see trout swimming through this, uh, this new passage. And these are uh, some of our volunteers, including the, the guy in the middle there, who at the time was president of the Greater Boston Chapter of Trout Unlimited. And I don't think I've ever seen that guy as happy as I saw him that day. And then further downstream, this actually is not in Walpole. This is the so-called Mill Pond Dam in Norwood. But this actual, this dam is uh, blocking Walpole's fish from being able to move upstream and downstream. So we're actually in the process right now of uh, working with the neighbors and the town who own this dam to, uh, to design and permit a removal for this dam. You know, many people tend to think of um, dams as sort of a permanent, uh, permanent piece of the landscape. And, and we have a lot of them, you know, that certainly with Walpole's industrial history, but around the watershed, we have about a hundred um, dams uh, most of which date back to the water power era and don't have a sort of modern economic purpose. And some of them certainly do provide some, some recreational benefits. Most of them are, are too small to provide economically feasible you know, water power benefits. Uh, this particular one is in very poor condition. So one of the big challenges with many of our dams is they're older. And a lot of people have the idea that dams control floods uh, and there are certain dams that control floods at the headwaters of Spring Brook is actually one of the two intentionally designed flood control dams in the Neponset watershed. But most of our dams, the ones that, that are always full of water, even when it's not raining, 
the major challenge they pose is that in a large flood, if they're not designed and maintained adequately, they will actually collapse as the, the flood waters overwhelm them and start to wash them away. And the problem is that they, they sort of multiply the flood when that happens. You've got a big flood, it's big enough to wipe out the dam, but when the dam fails, you're releasing not only the flood water, but the water that was stored in the dam. And, and the mill pond here is definitely in that category. It's actually partially breached itself in a few floods. Um, and it's really seriously impacting uh, the trout population. Walpole trout would be able to like, would like to be able to move up and down and uh, hopefully, if we're lucky, maybe even uh, starting this fall, we'll be disassembling this structure and, and we'll have a much more uh, robust trout population on trout pole park. You know, and then there's the simple stuff like just cleaning up junk out of the river. I mean, we want people to be able to go enjoy the river. So we, we now know that in most places, at least when it's sunny out, the river is, is clean, it's attractive, it's a great place to fish, go boating, what have you. Um, but there's still a lot of places where there's just trash in the river. Um, this is actually a cleanup we did a couple of years ago, uh, just upstream of uh, Plimpton Street. And this intrepid person has waded across the stream. There's somebody at the other end of that rope that she's gonna tie that to the bicycle. And then a team of people are gonna heave that, heave that across the way. This was the, the volunteers at the end of the day and they had shopping carts and tires and everything. And it's, it's actually a very satisfying way to spend a day, especially if you're like a, a desk person who pushes paper all day. There's sort of nothing like going out on the river, getting dirtier than you've ever been and uh, being able to point at, uh, at your accomplishments for the end of the day and the pile of junk that you uh, moved. So organizing things like this, we actually are planning a, um, a cleanup at uh, Bird Pond. There's actually a fair amount of debris both on the land and in the water in Bird Pond. We were gonna try to do it this spring. I think because of the pandemic, we're, we're gonna postpone that one. But if folks uh, know of spots that need cleanups, um, please let us know. We have lots of volunteers. Would like to help with this and if if you're interested in helping out we'd, we'd love to have your help um, another important thing that we need to do is uh protect land and create access to uh to the river and to our waterways you know the naponset uh in a lot of places is is not very accessible it's um sometimes referred to as the hidden river um and this is actually willet pond at sunset you can just see the the nose of the photographer's kayak there. It's really, Willet Pond is a um, amazing, beautiful body of water. It was built as an industrial water supply, but all of the industry was downstream. So it's very clean. Um, and Willet Pond had been uh, privately owned by a subsidiary of our organization for a number of years and privately owned by others before that uh, and had not been open to the public for about 70 years. And in 2019, we were able to um, we actually uh, stopped owning the pond, but we did uh, acquire a public access easement. So if you wanna go down and um, put your kayak in Willow Pond, uh, you can now do that, which, which we are just absolutely thrilled about. Similarly, Bird Pond is, um, is more accessible than, uh, than Willow Pond was, but interestingly, uh, the water of Bird Pond was privately owned and technically was not accessible to the public. And a couple of years ago, we were able to acquire a public access easement on the water of the pond that ensures the public's right to, um, to canoe and kayak there. So for the person who asked about where can you kayak, Willow Pond is a beautiful spot. Turner's Pond, you can launch on. Uh, Bird Pond is another great one. In the town forest, uh, it's a little bit of a walk with your kayak. Or a, or a roll if you have some of those wheels that strap on, but another great spot to launch. Um, and uh, the Ponset Reservoir up in Foxborough is not too far away, another beautiful spot. So lo lots of places to, uh, to put in a boat uh, in Walpole if you're selling climb. And then just to conclude, so, you know, I talked a little bit about the challenges and some of the things we're trying to, trying to do to address those challenges. And uh, we just want to encourage everyone sort of on a personal level to think about um, how you can help uh, make a healthy, accessible river that's something we can be, you know, proud to pass on to our kids. And, and all of us can play a role in that education piece, you know, educating our young people about, um, 
about the environment, get, frankly, getting them outside. So many young people are, are inside kind of too much now, you know, spending time getting your kids outside, helping them build an appreciation for uh, the resources that are right in their backyard. It's something really important we all can do with our kids or grandkids or the neighbor's kids or any kids you see around. Another thing you can do is get involved. You know, there are many opportunities to literally get your hands dirty. Um, this girl extracted, I don't even know what this thing is she's got, but she pulled that out of the mud and she was just unbelievably proud. And there's all kinds of opportunities to volunteer um, and to get actively involved. And I definitely encourage you to, uh, to do that. Visit our website and see about volunteer opportunities. We have a, um, an email newsletter that will tell you about things that are coming up. And then the last thing I just want to drive home that we really need people to do is to get uh, involved at the municipal level with these kinds of decisions. You know, people tend to think, oh, the federal government is going to you know, they must be the ones who protect the environment. And it's true, the federal government does play an important role and the state government plays an important role, but the level of government um, that has more impacts on the health of uh, your river than any other is the town of Walpole. And, and thankfully, it's also the most democratic of all our levels of government. Now, the town of Walpole defines um, priorities for how land is gonna be developed. Uh, whether developers will have to install devices to clean up runoff from their parking lots before it goes into the stream. The town of Walpole makes decisions about uh, how aggressively to try to encourage its residents to, uh, to conserve water and how to invest in maintaining its water and sewer system and whether to invest in those drainage systems. And with our um, old school New England uh, town meeting form of government, we, we all can take a very direct role in that and have a big impact. So I encourage people to get, uh, to get engaged with their community. This, I couldn't find a good picture of the, the Walpole town meeting. This is actually Milton's town meeting. Um, and then to end, I just, oh, I like to end with this slide. This is um, the daughter of, of uh, one of our board members who in, in full disclosure is probably about 25 now, but it's such a cute picture. And she's, she's holding a bucket filled with 5,000 uh, beetles that uh, are special beetles that eat the purple plant behind her, which is an invasive European plant that takes over wetlands. Um, and she was helping us uh, release these beetles who, who proceeded to devour the plant and have really uh, helped to control this invasive plant. But I think, you know, when I think about, um, you know, why, why it's worth spending time doing the kind of work that, that I do and sort of the satisfaction that I see um, so many of our volunteers get from this kind of work is it's really a realization of, um, you know, our role as stewards to help uh, create a better place, a healthier town, a healthier watershed, a resource that we can, can feel proud about passing down to the next generation. So I always like to end with that picture and that's at the end of my, uh, my slides. So if folks have uh, other questions, I'm happy to, um, happy to respond. Uh, what is the impact of surface and groundwater withdrawals on surface temp on stream temperatures? It's an excellent question. Um, and I don't really know the answer because nobody has done uh, a methodical question, a, a methodical study of it throughout the watershed. I think it is, it is likely substantial. You know, one of the things um, that we do see, we've been putting, as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time talking about Trap Hole Brook and it's, it's cold water trout fishery. Now, these are species that, that have to have cold water. And one thing that um, is very conspicuous is any place in the Neponset watershed where there are substantial water withdrawals, there are not trout. Um, so that's, that's not a methodical study or proof, but um, you know, it's a pretty common observation uh, across the watershed and across the state that, um, that that is a consequence of water withdrawal. Yes, I'm, I'm curious about how much do you, or first of all, do you observe and, and what would you estimate the amount of plastics that get into the river and get into the ocean? I, we, live, we live in East and, and we see a lot of plastics left on the streets and draining directly into ponds 
that go into the river here. And I just wondered if you've had any kind of estimates on how much the plastics uh, pollution is. It, it's a huge problem. You know, one of the, as you say, you know, those essentially all, even if you're nowhere near a river, you know, if there's a storm drain on your street, you might as well be standing right next to the river, you know, and, and litter that gets into storm drains, you know, most of it ends up in the river. So whether it's, you know, plastic bottles or, or other kinds of debris, um, particularly plastic, which is inclined to float, is uh, easier to mobilize than some other kinds of pollutants. I don't, you know, there have not been um, specific studies, quantitative studies on the deposit about how much uh, plastic uh, makes it through the system as a result of stormwater. But um, I can certain certainly tell you anecdotally, you know, one of the uh, things that we sometimes encounter that's pretty unpleasant is if you have, if you're paddling along and there's a downed tree, which is actually a very important uh, aquatic habitat. The, the bugs and fish and wildlife love a tree that's fallen into the water. Often those trees will function as strainers and behind them, you'll see a big raft of floating plastic debris, um, which is very yes. unappealing. Um, also, I would say we do um, a lot of cleanup work in the Neponset Estuary, which is down in Dorchester and Milton and Quincy which is sort of where the tides and the freshwater part of the river meet. And on those river cleanups, we really find a shocking amount of plastic, including you know, both large pieces of plastic and, and small pieces of plastic and, and, and really small bits of plastic um, that have sort of been sitting there for years and years and are breaking down into smaller and smaller, smaller pieces. So it's been, you know, we have looked at the possibility of um, trying to find some study to some funding to do some studies about particularly mic microplastics in the watershed, but it's not something we've been able to undertake yet, but it's definitely a problem. However, you're aware of the dams in Walpole and mm -hmm. um, don't dammed up parts of the Neponset River, for example, Bird Pond, uh, up in the town forest, uh, elsewhere, they help uh, retain water as well and recharge our aquifer. Tell me I'm wrong on that. Right. Um, so a, a couple things there. So what, one is um, this notion of the role that dams play in water retention. And I, th I think the answer is, is frankly very site dependent, very site specific. So, you know, I, I can't give a, a general answer that's going to be accurate in 100% of places. But generally, many of the dams in Walpole and, and in other parts of the Neponset watershed are what are called run of river dams. Like basically there was a river there and somebody came along and stuck up a dam and then the river backed up behind the dam. Um, and in many of those areas, the reality is that the, the, the groundwater was already flowing to and discharging to the river before they built the dam. And after you build the dam, it's continuing to flow to forward and discharge to the river. So in, in many cases, those sort of run of river dams are not um, increasing groundwater recharge. The thing, there are, you know, things you can do, particularly in terms of stormwater management, where you would try to capture, say, parking lot runoff in an area that's an upland area where you've got some, some height above the water table. And you can send that water into a, you know, a little holding area and let it soak into the ground. Um, and that can be very beneficial, but but the trouble is if if you're doing it where the where the water is already coming out anyway, you may not actually be gaining much retention. In terms of um, water power, um, you know I, I would say the question of what to do with a dam, uh, particularly in a, an, an aging dam that needs some love, uh, is is also always very site specific. You know, for example, I mentioned you know that we used to be involved in owning the Willow Pond. Um, which is a, a big body of water, has a really significant recreational uh, implications. And I'll be honest, we didn't make any effort to, uh, to remove the dam there, certainly not any meaningful effort. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, put a lot of value on that, that recreation. I think when we look at um, dams, though, we, we always start with the idea of uh, removal as being a viable option 
particularly if there are um, uh, sort of aquatic life and other wildlife resources there that would benefit from it. That doesn't mean in every case that's the conclusion you're going to reach, uh, but we certainly like the discussion to start with that, that assumption. And, and I would say, in reality, most of the dams that get rebuilt, and, and this is not specific to Walpole, but around the watershed, you know, it's sort of the path of least resistance to spend the money to rebuild the dam. And it's, it's very expensive. Um, and in many cases, it's, it's got adverse consequences for wildlife, for water quality, and for flooding. So we just try to encourage people to give it some thought. And, and the last point on um, hydropower, uh, you know, we, when we owned Willet Pond, we looked at the prospect of putting um, uh, some hydropower facilities on the Willet Pond Dam. And we didn't, we didn't exist, was a while ago we did this, um, but um, it's surprising how much water you need to have, uh, you know, and, and how consistently around the year you need to have it and how much vertical drop you would really like um, to have an economically viable uh, uh, hydrogen. Um, and there are a lot of these dams we're talking about, they're, they're little small things, um, which are not going to uh, be very economically. Uh, don't dams create ponds which create hard head pressure to recharge the, the aquifer? Again, it depends. Ends. I mean, they're not, you can't sort of, I, I can't make a blanket statement that, uh, you know, that, that a particular dam is or isn't a net gain in terms of recharge. I mean, in many cases, you're right, you are going to be creating increased head, which is going to create infiltration into the groundwater around the margins of the pond. And then that's basically going to flow downstream and just go back into the river you know, downstream of the pond. Um, you know, certainly there are situations where there can be some benefits to that, but, um, but there isn't a, isn't a hard and fast rule. And in many cases, it's not a, not a major consideration. Where in Willet Pond can she gain access, public access? Uh, so if you uh, Google Petty's Pond Lane, which is a small street, I think it's, it actually starts in, the beginning of it is in Walpole and the end of it is in Westwood. But the Petty's Pond Lane intersects uh, Brook Road and just at that intersection there is a small beach uh, on the pond side of the road and that is a public access point. So you can you can park, there's a side street parking on Petty's Pond Lane and you can just uh, walk across and uh, drop a boat in at the beach and, and enjoy yourself. So, Ian, I want to thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I think all of us need to know a lot more about the Neponset River and it is important for Walpole. So thank you so much for that. Um, I do want to just say that for uh, people still on the call that, that you know, please do go to um, the Neponset River Watershed uh, website. I, I am actually am a member of the association myself and uh, I think it's a good thing for us to support in Walpole doing, they're really doing a, a good a good job and, and obviously something very important for all of us that that we uh, you know we don't even all recognize that this important river so so I want to thank you and your organization for everything I want to thank everyone for for attending the presentation